All right, we're going to jump into this. Then. So uh, we've got our Christmas mini-series. This is two weeks. Um, so this week we're going to be looking at Jesus, the physical gift. Uh, the week after, Brother Scott's going to be hammering Jesus, the spiritual gift. I um, figured it'd be kind of cool to be able to look at that aspect and look at the different sides of Jesus and how he has changed kind of our lives and the world just based on him even just being here. So not just the fact that he is God or he is the son of man, you know, went to the cross, died, died for all of our sins, his blood shed to clean us completely white as snow, all those things. What does it mean physically for us, okay? So that's where we're going to start. That's what we're going to be looking at this week. Okay, so we've got the main, um, main prophecy that we're looking at today is Isaiah 7, 14. And it says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Okay, this is one of the most famous prophecies around. You know, there's a couple that are said at Christmas time. Um, but this one is kind of a big deal because it talks about physical things happening. You know, um, a lot of, a lot of uh, religions come down to someone do, seeing something, hearing something, and then acting on that. This is saying physically, what's going to happen here is a virgin shall conceive. That means she's going to get pregnant. She'll bear a son. She will give birth. And we'll call his name Emmanuel. And I think that is something to think about. Um, Isaiah 9, 6 also says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. These are all things that kind of point to Jesus' coming, Jesus being here on earth physically, okay? So, um, any ideas of how old these prophecies are when they were written roughly, what do you reckon? About 700, 700 years before uh, the birth of Christ. 700 years before <clears throat> Isaiah has written this down and said, hey, this is what's going to happen. Um, and this is, yeah, this is one of the most famous prophecies regarding the birth of Jesus, the Messiah in the Bible. But I want to tell you um, a couple of things. We're going to look into uh, just why this is important. And then we're going to look into five physical ways that Jesus was on this earth. And then five physical things that happen to us if we accept Jesus as the gift that he is to us. Okay. So uh, Matthew 1, 23 tells us again his name, Emmanuel, which is translated to God with us. God with us. That doesn't mean God up in the air airy fairy floating around up there, that means God with us. The fact that Jesus was a gift to this earth and physically came down from heaven, physically was born to a virgin, physically was born onto this earth, and was physically walking, breathing here. That's the, that's the biggest gift out of all of this um, for us to understand. A lot of religions point to this spirit God, big guy in the sky, Something like that. And you can say that's Old Testament God. To counter that, Jesus came down, right? He came down from heaven, physically touched this earth. Which is why <clears throat> this, series, this little mini series is Jesus, the physical gift. Brother Scott's doing the spiritual gift next week, but this week is the physical gift. Jesus Christ, the physical gift. So, what does that tell us? It tells us that Jesus is physically with us, okay? That's as easy as it needs to be. I could stop the study now and just base it on a Matthew 1, 23 and be like, he would be called Manuel, which means God with us. Boom. Done. He's with us. But I want to tell you a little bit about gift. Okay? John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We all know that verse. Kind of a key verse. Probably one of the most one in verses in the whole Bible, okay? Um, but what is the point in a gift if it isn't given? I've used this example before. We had a Christmas tree. We had a gift left under the Christmas tree. My boys were like, oh, no, there's a gift left over. And the guy wasn't coming to pick it up because he's deployed in the military. It was going to be a couple of months. I'm like, well, what should we do? I said, I don't know. Well, I want to start taking down these Christmas decorations. You know, it's the 26th of December. Let's get rid of them. Christmas is over. My kids love Christmas. They're like, no, we want to keep it up. Let's keep it up until his gift can be picked up. Because it's a gift. What are we going to do if it doesn't? 
I'm like, he's not back until like March. What are we doing? <laughs> I'm not having a Christmas tree in March. But the point is, they didn't want that gift to be forgotten. They didn't want that gift to be put into a cupboard and be like collecting dust until it came back. They wanted to see it and be like, I want to remember to give this to this person. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. The ultimate gift. The ultimate present to us, right? He gave us a perfect gift in his son, Jesus Christ. Why? Again, it's in that verse, because he loves the world. Right? I love my son, so I like to give them good gifts. I've got two boys, they love gifts. They love gifts. They love presents. I've told you before, you put a present in front of them, we've had to slow them down and say, no, first you go give a hug, a high five or a handshake, the three H's, and you say thank you. And they're like, yeah, but we don't even know what the gift is. We don't know if it's good. I'm like, I don't care. You say thank you first, then you get your gift. And as soon as they said thank you, they're like, thank you so much, and then run back and Wrapping paper's gone, they're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing, best gift ever. You know, but none of the gifts that I have ever given to them, or will ever give them, match up to what gift God gave to us, right? God gave us the perfect gift through his son, Jesus Christ. Not only uh, have we been offered this incredible gift, but Jesus coming to earth, Jesus being born through a virgin, through Mary, and doing all the things he did, <clears throat> it fulfilled so many prophecies. The incredible thing is, um, we know that this is what happened. This happened. We know that Isaiah um, uh, 9-6 happened, that when Jesus was born, the government was on his shoulders. What was the government trying to do? They were trying to find all newborn baby boys and kill them. Straight away, the government was on his shoulders. And what happened later on? Whilst he's walking up the hill to Calvary, the government literally put their torture device on his shoulders. This happens. This prophecy has been fulfilled. It has happened, okay? <clears throat> Jesus walked on this earth, breathed the air that we breathe. Jesus was physically on the earth. It is amazing to me to, uh, to tell you this, but I had a history teacher in my school, and he was a Christian, and I loved him. He was called Mr. Holden's story, and he basically said, Jamie, if I could tell you about Jesus, and I was like, I don't want to know about Jesus. I wasn't a Christian back then, I didn't care. And he said, well, I can tell you, do you know Julius Caesar? And I said, of course I know Julius Caesar. He's like, who's Julius Caesar? I'm like, leader of the Rome, Lead Romans, big deal. Big guy, R ruled a lot of the world uh, to one time, right? And he said, what have I told you? There is more evidence that a man named Jesus walked on this earth than Julius, Julius Caesar was even around. I said, right, that sounds incredibly ridiculous because Everyone knows Julius Caesar. And he said, well, you should know that everyone should know Jesus. Because there's just as much or more evidence that Jesus was on this earth than Julius Caesar. This just gives me hope. This just gives me a lot of hope about the truth that is Jesus Christ, right? He walked on this earth, he breathed this air, he was physically. So, <clears throat> whilst Jesus was on this earth, he did a lot of things. That's an understatement. Okay, read the Gospels. Understand he did a very a, a huge magnitude of things. Right? Um, but there are, five, there are five things that we're going to go through here. What Jesus physically did on this earth. And then we're going to look at five things, how it mean, what it means to us, basically. Okay? So, if my PowerPoint's going to work, he lived. Jesus lived. That's Luke 2, 7. It says, And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Mary's firstborn son was Jesus. He lived. He was born, raised, taught, and lived. We can read in Luke 2, 41 to 52, all about Jesus as a young boy surrounded by teachers being around teachers, learning, but then flipping the script and then teaching them about God the Father. Right? It tells you about development. It wasn't just Jesus was born, boom, perfect. There was development. There was something more to just like being here. He lived, he was taught, he learned, and then he taught as well. But the fact that Jesus actually lived on this earth gives us a great example of how we should live. <clears throat> 
great thing about Paul, we've been just uh, been going through uh, Ephesians, and, and Paul gives us great examples about how to live as well, but all of the examples that he gives points us back to Jesus. Follow me as I follow him. Do as I do, because I'm trying to do what he did, right? And that's the whole point here. Jesus was and is the perfect example of how we should live. And we've got four more things that we're going to look at here that kind of show us a little example about how we should actually live and how we should actually be able to do things. And um, the first thing here is Jesus taught. He taught. <clears throat> so let's have a look at Mark 9.31. Mark 9.31 says this, uh, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Why is this important? For Jesus to teach this to his disciples. Why is it that important that this message was taught? What do you think, Adam? The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Why is that so important to teach them? It's true to teach him that he's coming back. They didn't listen too well to that, though. Exactly. The great, the great thing is, he's telling them the truth. Like the whole time, he's told them right from the beginning here. In the very in the Gospels, as he's walking around with them, Jesus didn't say, ah, it's all going to be fine. He was telling them the truth. He was telling them, this is exactly what's going to happen. I'm going to come back. This is going to happen. They're going to get me. They're going to collect me up. They're going to take me and torture me. They're going to beat me. They're going to accuse me. They're going to arrest me. They're going to make me walk up a hill with a cross on my back. They're going to get me to the top. They're going to crucify me. They're going to stab me in the side of a spear. They're going to bring me down. But I'm coming back. <clears throat> and as Asim says, they didn't believe him. Not everyone understood the actual message. He had to say it a fair few times, and then it actually physically happened. They were like, I guess he was right. But you could have caught along with that right from the very beginning here, man. Come on. But the basis of Jesus' teachings, the time that he taught his disciples, are complex, they're deep, they're profound. But they are still simple enough for us all to understand. Jesus taught that everyone needs salvation, and that salvation is not down to your own works, but in fact your relationship with God and his work on the cross. It's about that. Jesus taught on the kingdom of God. Kingdom. The kingdom is mentioned over, over 50 times in the Gospels. There's four books, it's mentioned over 50 times. Many of Jesus' parables were about the kingdom of God. You can look at Matthew 13, 3 to 9, Matthew 13, 24 to 30, Matthew 13, 31 to 32, and Matthew 13, 33. There's a lot of Matthew 13s right in there. And you just look at that chapter and just read about the kingdom of God. Yeah. But Jesus taught around so uh, around parables, about 50 parables, but took every opportunity to teach people heading to the temple at any time he could. <clears throat> we read about that as we were finishing up our Gospel of uh, John. And as we went through the, um, the Gospel of John, we worked out that every time that Jesus went into a main city, usually his first stop was the temple. Usually his first stop was to get in and just start talking to people. Hey, by the way, I've got a message for you. Hey, I heard there's this really great restaurant in this town. Yeah, great, great. You guys go to that. I'm going to the temple. And he was just... That was what he wanted to do. He wanted to take the opportunity. Because he was living, he wanted to teach. Because he was living, because he was physically alive, he wanted to physically teach people. And what they needed to know was the truth. The other thing Jesus did was he did not waste his words. Jesus taught. Jesus taught. He taught the truth. He did not lie. Right? <clears throat> um, Mark 9.31. Again, it says... For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. Jesus taught the disciples the truth all the way to the end, right? The life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus taught the truth, did not waste his words, and took the opportunities presented to him to do so, okay? Next thing he did, he healed. He healed. Jesus healed a lot of people, and there are a lot of scriptures that we can look at here, but Jesus, as a physical being, 
walked on this earth, breathed the air around us. I've already said this a couple of times. But then it says he physically healed people. In some um, situations, he physically touched them to heal them. It wasn't just a word. It wasn't just a prayer. It wasn't just a, and they were healed. He didn't just walk through, clicking his fingers like, boom, 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 healed, healed, healed. <laughs> no, it was hands touching these people and healing them. We have Matthew 8, 3, which was the man with leprosy. Leprosy, you weren't allowed to go near people with leprosy. That was a big no-no. You go near people with leprosy, then you have to be quarantined as well. You get a little spot in a village outside of the town, basically the village for the dead. You either died there or you're healed. And if you're healed, you came back, and you were back in society. If you didn't heal, you were a goner. No one came and visited you, yet Jesus walks through, and people come up to him, and he touches the man, and he is healed. Mark 10, 16, Jesus laid his hands on people, and they were healed. Mark 10, 16, that one's pretty close here, so I'm going to jump to that and read that one for you. And <clears throat> it said, um, well, 15, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. 16, he took them on his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. He physically touched these children. He blessed them by lifting them up, putting them onto his lap. That's physical touch. That's physically blessing. That's physically healing. That's physically being there. A Jesus who did not come down, a God who is in spirit form, cannot do that. Cannot do this physical touch. Cannot do this physical healing. Okay. Luke twenty-two fifty-one. In the garden, as they come to collect up Jesus, who swung the sword? Anyone remember? Who took the swing of the sword? Peter. There you go. Whips out his knife. Whoosh! Takes off the guy's ear. And what does Jesus do? Stop. Touches <clears throat> the guy's ear, and he's healed. There's a touch. It's a physical touch. Jesus took the chance to physically touch and heal people. Jesus was a physical presence wherever he went. Remember when people started not liking Jesus? What did they do? All crowded around him. Why? Because he was in physical form. He was a physical being. He was on this earth. And yeah, there was moments where he was able to just pass through them. Not be able to be touched or anything like that. But he was physical enough that people think, thought that they could get him. When his time came, the soldiers came and arrested him. This tells you he was a physical being, right? And I'm not trying to prove it to you guys. I know you guys know that Jesus is real. I know you guys know that he physically came down to this earth. But it's really important that we really believe this stuff. Because otherwise he's just an airy, fairy spirit in the sky that people talk about. And I don't take it too seriously. Uh, he was real. He walked, he healed, he talked to people. He was here, you know, on this earth. That's the whole point. Next thing Jesus did, he led. He led people. John 10, 4 says, And, and when he put forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The sheep know his voice. He is the shepherd. Jesus is that shepherd. We are the sheep. We hear his voice and have a chance to follow, to listen, and to obey. Matthew 9, 36, feeding the 5,000. Jesus uh, looked at the multitude of people and had compassion on them as they were like sheep without a shepherd. They had no one to follow. They weren't following anyone. Without Jesus, we are just that cheap, scared, lost, without hope, without direction. But Jesus has compassion on us. He has compassion on the lost. He wants to lead us. He wants us to follow him and to know his voice. Matthew 4, 19 to 20, Jesus tells the fishermen to follow him. It's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's when he walks up to these guys who are pulling nets into their boat, fixing them all up, throwing the fish into the buckets. Just doing fisherman stuff. And he says, hey, you know what? Don't just be fishermen. Become fishers of men. Follow me. Jesus is worthy to follow. You can trust in him. Right? Something important to think about is, who do you follow? 
you follow competent people? Do you follow someone that you trust? So you just follow anyone who's in front of you? Jesus is saying, I follow me because I can give you a new life. I can give you a new hope. I can give you what you need in this world. Follow me and I can give you a rock. You're not just fishermen. You're fishers of men. That's different. Right? <clears throat> Next thing Jesus did, he died and rose again. Mark 16, 6. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Do you see Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified? He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. Question, why would they have a tomb, a place to lay someone if they weren't physically there? If Jesus wasn't physically around, why would he need a place to lay the body? This all points to Jesus being physically around. Jesus being a physical gift from God to save us, to help us. But Jesus was crucified. Jesus lay dead, but he rose again. He rose again triumphant against sin, against Satan, and death. And because Jesus was physically walked this earth, Jesus was physically beaten, was tortured, was spat on. He was physically pinned to that cross, nailed there for all of our sins, taken down after death, physically placed into a tomb until victory. And that's the thing right there. Physically, all these things happen. But what did we read right at the very beginning? That government would be on his shoulders, that people would be after him straight away, that a virgin would conceive and bear a son and call him Emmanuel, that he would be God with us because he is truly with us, right? It wasn't a vague mystery that no one witnessed that Jesus rose again. Jesus appeared to the women and later to the disciples. People saw physical Jesus. They were invited to touch his wounds. Remember Doubting Thomas? Not a very nice name to have in the Bible, by the way. Would not want to be called Doubting Jamie. But Jesus literally said to him, You see me. I'm here. Come and touch these nail wounds. Come and touch my side where the spear went in. You see the scars on my head from the crown of thorns? Come check them out. They're still there. Come and see. Come and know that I'm real. So Jesus was physically on this earth. A physical gift for mankind to accept. Which gets us to our final kind of page here, our final section of thoughts. First question I've got for you. Have you accepted the physical gift that is Jesus Christ? Have you accepted? Because there is a gift, and he came down in human form. He was born, he walked this earth. You can have that gift. You can have Jesus in your life. Again, Brother Scott's going to talk about the spiritual gift next week. This is the physical. He's talking about the spiritual, how it can change our spiritual lives. For us, uh, let me tell you some physical things you'll experience once you accept that gift that is Jesus Christ. You, ex you get peace with God. Peace. Peace that passes understanding. Right? Romans 5.1 tells us, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, being justified, washed white as snow. Justified, blameless. Right? Nothing to uh, be accused of. There's nothing left. Okay? So being justified, being wiped clean by faith. Faith in who? Lord Jesus Christ. There is a washing that happens once you accept Jesus into your life, and then you experience true peace. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. That God who is justified to judge us. That is just to judge us. Right? He is the Almighty Judge. He is the righteous judge. He is the judge that can turn around and say, Guilty! Not guilty. Big gavel, hammering away, you know? But being justified by our faith, knowing that Jesus lived, died, and rose again. That's the hope. Peace only through our Lord Jesus Christ. True peace that we can never truly understand. You ever, ever, ever go out into uh, like the wild and it's just really quiet? You're like, oh, it's nice to get this wild here. 
Well, that's not peace. That's just the absence of noise, right? The absence of, of other stuff. Peace of God is like the absence of sin. The absence of chaos. The absence of Satan right, in our lives. And that's a real tough thing to think about. But when we're truly with God, when we truly are justified by faith, we can have that peace. And it will change our lives. Second thing we get is rest. We're going to look at Matthew 11, 28 to 30. It says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. You shall find rest into your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. There's a lot that you can get out of this passage here. But come unto me, all ye that are labor and are heavy laden. You've been working hard. You ever had a really tough day at work? When I worked in the lumber mill, and I would come home exhausted, I'd walk in and Rachel would be like, Hey, babe, how are you doing? And I'm like, I'm just going to the couch. And I'd like face plant the couch, boom, and just sleep for like an hour. Wake up and be like, okay, I'm here. I'm here. That wasn't rest. That wasn't rest. That was exhaustion. Right? Jesus is saying, I can give you rest into your soul. Your body's heavily burdened. You're carrying a lot. All those things that, you're, that are on your shoulders right now, that yoke that's put across you, heavy. Give it to me. Let me give you rest. And I tell you, once you start trusting in Jesus, once you start accepting that he is here, once you start saying, you know what, I don't want to carry this anymore. Are you sure you got it? And then he'll be like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yours and many of us, thank you very much. Let me just put that yeah, that's easy. Once you start noticing that, you live differently. Because you're not just resting whilst you sleep. You're resting in Jesus. You're resting knowing that the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the one who came down from heaven to earth to die for our sins, has taken every single thing off of our shoulders if we allow him to. <clears throat> if we allow him to. The rest is a physical rest. It's taken away off your shoulders, but it also has a spiritual aspect to it as well. Your heart isn't weighed down by all these things anymore. Your heart can be lifted up and, and, and set free, right? It's not chained down. It's not pinned down. Those chains have been broken, which gets us into our next one, freedom. Freedom, we're looking at John 8, 34 to 36. And it said, Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. Woo! You commit sin. You are a servant to that sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. <clears throat> True freedom from sin. Forgiven and set free from sin. Not just forgiven by a friend, like, ah, oh, you know, you have my feelings, I'll get over it. Oh, God, I forgive you, whatever. Not even by a neighbor, but the son of God. Jesus Christ. If you've been set free, then it is total forgiveness. I like to think of a whiteboard, <clears throat> and we're talking, and we're like, oh, I did this wrong, we did that wrong. You're like, okay, I'm going to write it on the whiteboard, going to write it soon enough. You keep writing about all the things you've done wrong in your day, that whiteboard's going to be pretty filled up. And I do this for my sons, and we like write down a list, and then I'll be like, okay, well, I forgive you for it. And they're like, what? And I'll rip up the list. And if it's a white boy, I'll just wipe it all up like, oh, what, what, what did we do today? That's what Jesus does for us every single day. Accepting that freedom. Accepting that rest. Accepting that, that every single chain of sin is cut off completely. What does that physically mean for us? It's life changing. It means that we can worship without knowing without having to think about all the problems that we have going on in our lives, so we can focus truly on God and who he is, and that we are made free by Jesus Christ's blood on the cross. True freedom that the world cannot offer, only through Jesus Christ. 
So, true freedom. True freedom only through Jesus Christ. And I, I will tell you, um, before I became a Christian, I would walk with my head down. Because I was ashamed. I was ashamed of how I lived. I was ashamed about how people viewed me. Um, I had my long hair, my ripped up jeans, so I'd always be wearing black, uh, black undershirt, a black band t-shirt. It was only black. There's only one color necessary in the world. And it was black. Um, and, and I'd walk around with my head down like this because I just wouldn't want people to notice me. What Jesus does is he takes all that weight off. He takes that, those sin, that sin off your shoulders, the chains away from you that are weighing you down and allows you to stand up and see what's around you. It is a physical action of those sins and those burdens being taken off your shoulders. Again, so you can rest in him because his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. But also because you have been set free. And if you've been set free by Jesus, you are free indeed. That's like you are so free, you don't even know. <laughs> like, like you know freedom because you're like, go outside and play in the back garden. But the back garden's got a fence around it. But you think it's the giant, biggest thing in the world, right? When you're younger. When you grow up to be an adult and you're like, I used to think that thing was a jungle. It had like one tree in it. That's not, that's not freedom, that's like a bad garden. What Jesus is saying, be free. Let all those other things go. Allow yourself to be free in this stuff. And it's a physical freeing of all those burdens, of all those things. Hope, we're looking at 1 Peter 1.3. It says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy have begotten us again in a lively hope by the resurrection of Christ, of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hope. Hope's a big deal. In this world, there is not much hope. <laughs> there is not much optimism. There's not much hope for the future, right? But hope in Jesus, what does it say? A hope in mercy. A hope in the resurrection. Hope that brings us life. A hope that promises a future for us all. That's what we're bringing in here. That's what we're believing. And I don't know about you, but I don't like to think of like the end of the world. And I don't like to think of what's happening next. I like to think for my sons that they're going to have a great life. That they're going to grow up. They're going to marry a beautiful lady. And they're going to pop out tons of grandchildren. And I get to be an amazing granddad with a ginormous beard. That's my hope. But without Jesus, there is no hope. Because Jesus is the only true hope in this world. That's the truth. Without the resurrection, Jesus is just another dead guy. Right? Without God's mercy, this plan of salvation that Jesus came down to earth wouldn't have happened. Without hope, we wouldn't have a clue. So we have to have hope. As Christians, we have to have hope. And that's a physical hope as well of, of the future, but it's a spiritual hope as well of knowing who Jesus is and believing. Not that I hope tomorrow will be good, but tomorrow's going to be just as good as it was today, which was pretty bad. But the Bible tells me it's going to happen. The consistent thing is my hope in Jesus Christ, that he will be with me, that he will never abandon me, he will never forsake me. That he's walking before me, behind me, and to the side of me. That's what the Bible tells me. That every day I wake up, that his mercy is new every single day. That's truth that I can truly hope in and believe in. Right? And the final one here, and this is one of my favorite ones, is identity. Identity. And we're going to be looking at uh, John 1, verse 12. And it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to him, to them, sorry, that believeth on his name. To become the sons of God. We have a new identity in Jesus Christ. To them that believe in his name, we are given a new purpose and a new identity through Christ Jesus. 
Think about the disciples. Think about those guys in the boat that were just fishermen. Think about all of the other rabbis that had come by and have passed over and passed by and passed by again and again and again because they just weren't smart enough. They just weren't good enough. They weren't the best of the best. They were average or less than that. But Jesus came up to them and said, Come fishers of men with me. Come with me. Follow me. I'm going to change your identity. I'm going to change who you were into who you are now. Hey, Saul, I know that you don't like people. I know that you don't like Christians. But you know what I'm going to do for you? I'm going to make you blind so that you can see the truth. And you're going to be one of the best missionaries for me. You're going to be the best, one of the best gospel deliverers for me. Jesus changes our identity. And that is a physical change. It is not just a spiritual change. It starts on the inside. It is your heart that has to change, right? But it is a physical change. I don't know about you guys, but I just told you. You used to have the long hair. You used to wear the black shirts. I became a Christian, and what did I do? I buzzed this hair off. I wanted to be different. I didn't want to be the same Jamie because I wasn't the same Jamie anymore. I wasn't the same guy. I was looking to Jesus. So I shaved my head, and people didn't recognize me, and I was like, whoo. I can walk around with my head up high. I can change who I am by following Jesus. And I didn't change who I was. I didn't do anything except believe in Jesus, except believe in him. He changed my heart. He offered me a new identity. But it is a physical identity change. It is saying you don't need to be the same anymore because there is something better. And that better thing is accepting the gift that is Jesus Christ. So my final question for you this evening, and we're going to finish, is have you accepted the gift that is Jesus Christ into your life? Have you accepted the physical gift that is Jesus Christ? He walked on his earth. He breathed the air. He physically healed people. He was a physical human being. He lived. He died. Rose again, offering us hope, offering us rest, offering us peace with God, offering us freedom, offering us a new identity. Have you accepted that gift and all of the things that come with it? Because that's what we can do. That's what Jesus is offering every single day. That gift is out every single day of the year, as awkward as it gets with a Christmas tree around it. That gift is under the tree until you accept it. Accept it. No Jesus.